This episode of Fuel for the Soul is powered by ASICS. Head over to ASICS.com and sign up for a one ASICS account. It's completely free, and when you sign up, you will receive 10% off your first purchase. You'll also gain access to exclusive colorways on ASICS.com, free standard shipping, special birthday month discounts, and more. Hi, this is Thomas with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Featherstone Nutrition. Dun, 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 dun. AKA Feathers, <laughs> that if you now have seen her, you probably have recognized her from Instagram. She's pretty Instagram famous. She has this Toast Crunkle show every morning that you can watch. She usually has wild children doing something mm-hmm. around her, and she's baking mm-hmm. something that tastes like something, but is something that's healthier than normally what you would get if you were tasting something. Did I get that all correct? That was one of the most delightful highlight reels I've heard in a while. You nailed it. <laughs> All right. Poof. Feathers. You like it. All right. And you are listening to, or maybe watching now that this is on YouTube, uh, Fuel for the Soul, the podcast where we talk all things nutrition and hydration and how it affects performance. And Thomas, before we dive into some we'll of the We'll have to be careful now, like no picking your nose or anything. Were you doing that before? You know, I thought about it, but now that there's cameras on, I got to make sure that I don't do anything like that. The cameras have always been on, FYI. We just haven't been publishing the video. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually here That's for the amazing. random things. Like, I mean, All I'm right. here for you randomly picking your nose and forgetting that <laughs> we're on video. <laughs> Anyway, before we dive into the questions, an we got sent some stuff from Gnarly Sports Nutrition. I'm going to say it again. This isn't an ad. No, they asked us to try it. I've been trying uh, the both things. As a matter of fact, one of them I'm drinking right now, but the other one I've been trying now for a little bit. They sent first this whey grass-fed protein. Do you approve of these, Megan? Yeah, I was just Gnarly pulling nutrition. up their stuff. I'm pretty sure they're either Informed Choice or NSF certified. I'm just pulling it up to there's, see. Yeah, there's something on here. May, can you read that? NSF. Oh. NSF. Yeah. NSF. I mean, they've been on my radar as like a super reputable company, um, but I haven't tried their stuff. So gnarly. Send me some to give a whirl too. Yeah. Nah, just keep sending it to me. No, we'll get them <laughs> to send you stuff. But okay, so this I found very interesting because we were just talking about how Scratch changed their lingo. This is called Hydrate Extra Sodium. Is it, yeah. But what she's holding now, so we had two things, because we got to remember, not everybody's got the video. We st- we had a canister of protein, the whey grass-fed protein, and they also sent this new, because the limited edition flavor. Salted margarita. Who doesn't Ooh. sound fun? You want that, that sounds good. Yeah. That's if you want to party while you're taking your run, like yeah. you're doing your run, you'd be like, I'll take a salt. But also, like, a way that I've used this stuff in the past, which you may or may not recommend, but if I've been drinking, like, say, Thanksgiving, and I'm tying it on a little bit extra, before I go to bed, I usually take, like, one of these hydration mixes and drink up a nice 12 to 24 ounces of, of hydration mix because it's got the electrolytes to try to help me with not having a hangover. Well, I mean, that's what Liquid IV was originally made for. It was made for hangovers, and then it was made for airplanes, and then they were like, wait, athletes will... So, like, that's... It works. I thought you were going to say you put tequila in it, and I was going to be like, well, Thomas, that's interesting. But no, you're actually rehydrating post-beverages. I mean, I would try the tequila in it. It <laughs> tastes, at first this morning, for some reason, it didn't taste as strong as it does now. Like, at first, I was like, well, it's a really light flavor. It's probably because of how much water you added. <laughs> Twenty. I did two two scoops with 24 ounces, which is what they recommended. Try it, oh. Meg. 24 to 32 ounces, actually. Maybe he did 32 one time. Oh, no, that's very strong. Okay. Yeah. Very potent. Cheers. It definitely My Sparkling Cheers. water. <laughs> everybody, everybody, we Cheers. are now having a hydration break on hydration. the show. <laughs> Grab your beverage and swig some back. <laughs> Welcome to the happy hour. <clears throat> All right. So that's enough about gnarly, but so far, Thomas is enjoying it. Megan, we'll get you some and we'll see what you think too. But wait, Sounds good. before we get off of it, I'm curious about the, the high sodium here. So we know that we use the hyperhydration before the race day, especially if it's going to be hot. And we use scratch during the race, which has a certain amount of sodium. 
if this is kind of somewhere in between there, would you recommend it for everybody or people that really have a high sweat count? So what I'm, I'm looking it up now so I can look at the actual ingredients, but what I'm thinking this is, is probably something to help rehydrate like after. You said it was like four grams of sugar, I think. So my thought is this is competing with liquid IV, which I usually have people drink either before or after a hot run that are heavy, salty sweaters. Like, because the sodium, the flavor, the sweetness is gonna help you drink more of it and absorb it faster. So like if you're having trouble staying on top of your hydration because you're a heavy sweater or it's the middle of the summer, something like this would help you with that. Um, I don't know. Okay, I'm looking at it now. Yeah, I don't know that I would take this with me on a run, but I would definitely either do it before or after. Very cool. And while we're on the topic of hydration, Megan, we all just ran the Boston Marathon, and so did someone else named Emma Bates, who apparently went on a podcast and talked about her fueling hydration strategy, which was shocking to some of us. I think she went on our friend Allie on the Runs yes, podcast. Yes, her name's Allie Feller. She did. Allie Feller? Is yeah. that her? Yeah. <laughs> I think I've heard of her. She also announced us at the Boston Marathon, and when we ran across the finish line, she said... Final check-in, because that's our other podcast that dropped. <laughs> uh, you finished the Boston Marathon. Yay. That's awesome. I was like all excited, and she came down and gave us hugs and stuff. It was awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So she, Emma Bates, was on Allie Feller's like Boston Recap, and she told everyone that she tapes her pineapple can gel to an empty water bottle so that it's easier to grab, obviously, at all these aid stations, but that she doesn't drink any water or didn't drink water at the Boston Marathon, and people are coming out of the woodwork going, Megan, what? Why isn't she? What's going on? Everybody had to ask, you know, what the deal was with this. And I think it's a phenomenal reminder that each one of us has a very different sweat rate and sweat composition. So what I have observed with a lot of the pros is they are not heavy sweaters and they are not salty sweaters. And that might actually play a little bit of a role into their performance benefits, right? If they're not getting dehydrated, they're performing at a higher level throughout their race. So that could be a piece of it. So if she didn't sweat much, you guys ran Boston. Like it was 50, but it was cool with the headwind and we were soaked from the rain. Like I never once felt hot and I'm somebody who runs very, very hot. Like last year's Boston, you know, I was sweating like crazy. It was 52 and sunny. So so if she doesn't sweat much and it was that cold, she probably didn't need a whole lot of fluid. And she was only out there for, what, two hours and 22 minutes or something like that. Um, so she probably just didn't need nearly the amount of fluid that some of us would need. So are you saying that typically Emma Bates is a soggier human than the rest of us? <laughs> I'm saying she's probably not a soggier human. Well, no, because she needs the hydration. It's obviously, she's got she's got built in. Oh, build in socks. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. so she's waterlogged where we <laughs> expel ours. So she's walking around like a jelly monster. <laughs> That's one way to, I suppose, look at it. And then the other people are asking too wait, she only takes you can. There was a lot of questions about that. But I did the math. If she's taking a you can every 5K, which is where those bottles are and what she stated, that means she's, for her marathon pace, she's running a 5K like every 17 minutes. So if she's taking one of the you can edges, which has 19 grams of carbs every 5K, she's getting 67 grams of carbs an hour, which is pretty legit. Like that's a lot of carbs. We always say like start at 50 and scale up if you can. So she's actually taking in an impressive amount. Um, it's just, I think the water that everybody was like, what? So wait, is the you can... Uh, from what I understand, it's a bigger packet mm -hmm. and has liquid in it, right? You know, I was actually trying to find that information out because I was wondering the same thing. Like, I think there's probably at least an ounce of fluid, maybe one and a half in each of those packets. So technically, she was getting, what would that be, like four to six ounces of fluid an hour from her gels, whereas something like the Morton really doesn't have any water with it. Yeah. So she hydrated before mm -hmm. and had a pretty soggy uh, disposition, <laughs> plus having uh, the liquid in the generation you can. And then clearly she's going to probably have a Modelo at the finish because that's her favorite. <laughs> is that her? Um, is it? Okay. She's probably good, right? I think so. Like, on, Obviously it worked for her. She performed amazing, you know? Um, yeah. So I think it's just good to remember. She makes it look somewhat yeah. easy. She like does. It, she's got a smile on her face. She's rolling. 
Like that, she's pretty impressive. She always looks so good out there too. She looks strong. She never really decompensates. Mm-hmm. Like she looks happy. Like you guys are saying. Like she just she always looks great out there. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't have those finish line photos of like my face is falling off. It's like, <laughs> or like my downstep photos where my whole body looks like it's sagging into the concrete and asphalt. <laughs> yeah. The downstep, man. That's so harsh. It's gravity, I mean, Meg. It's just yeah. mean. Yeah. We can talk about that too, but it's not nutrition. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing you can fix. All right. So, I mean, the moral of the story is Emma Bates is the superhuman and she's got a crazy low sweat rate. This is the thing. We talk about all this stuff and we give best practices on the show all the time. And so mm-hmm. Emma Bates kind of like flying in the face of what we would normally recommend. And you say, OK, well, maybe she's an anomaly or something like that. But what does someone like how how do we determine if you need this is it because she's practiced this in training runs like what like how do you tell somebody yeah you need to be drinking this much water during a marathon but it's okay for emma bates not to so i think one of the best things that we can do is understand what our own sweat rate is so we talk about that all the time like simply weigh in and out around run see how much fluid you lose is it a little bit is it a lot so if we did that to emma bates i would assume that she's probably barely losing a pound out there during her race which is 16 ounces which is not very much where some of us lose 30 to 40 ounces an hour which that is going to take a toll on our bodies so we do have to have a plan for that okay so we got a question recently from Becca, good game. Good game. That's a cool name. Yeah, I thought so. Um, good game. Which was very interesting. So I pulled it out, and so this is what she said. She said, hi, guys. I'm a huge fan of y'all, and honestly, Megan's wisdom has radically changed the way I eat and fuel my running. Wait, which Megan? The feathers. Oh, okay. I'm in a season of she running ultras feathers. and have been curious about how your recommendations might adapt to that scenario. I follow a few different ultra runners. Most are on a carb train, on the carb train. I know that females specifically don't do great on low carb training. So with all those caveats, I'm on your team. I wanted to share this interesting podcast with Zach Bitter, reviewing a new study showing that runners on a very low carb diet versus those on a mid to high carb diet showed no performance difference in a couple different trials. Would love your thoughts. I would love to. So that is fascinating. (laughs) It is right. Right. So headlines versus like digging into the weeds. This is a perfect example of that. So the headlines say low carb versus high carb diet, same running performance. It's like, whoa, right? But what we need to do is dive into how many people were in the study and the actual logistics of the study. So there was 10 people in this study. And what they did is for 31 days, they put them on a low carb diet. And then 31 days on a high carb diet, they had like a two week washout in the middle. So it was the same people trying both things. And what they found was, um, or the, and then they put them through some different tests at the end. So this is the part that's the most fascinating to me is the tests were one mile race or six by 800 meters. That is a very different story than a half marathon, full marathon, triathlon, yeah. Ironman. So can we even look at this data and extrapolate it to endurance training? I, I don't think we can. I think that's a totally different conversation. It's fascinating research, but when we really look at what they were testing and the performance, you know, I, I don't think it's applicable to our population. Do we know who backed this study? Like who, who put on this study? Because, I mean, this is not going to prove anything for the endurance athlete, like you're saying. Right. Well, let's see. I'm looking at it right now. Sometimes they'll show you conflict of interest. I mean, I can run a mile yeah. with nothing in me. Right. Yeah. Like I could fast right. for three days and run a mile. Right. So when we look at like carb loading and adequate carbohydrates, it's for people doing something for like over 45 minutes to an hour. I mean, people run a mile in five, six, seven minutes, <laughs> you know? So, and even at first I wasn't sure if the six repeats were 800s or miles so i was like okay wait if it was six mile repeats that piques my interest but it was six 800 repeats you know so even that is you know partly anaerobic it's just not the same comparison so um i think that's the most interesting thing but then if you dive into it a little bit more and i put this graph in here if you blow it up a little bit you can see it what so the 10 people did both experiments right high carb and low carb and if you can see what it's showing is like performance change on the graph on the right and it's showing you 
what their time was at the beginning of the month and the end of the month on different things. So as you can see, there was a couple people in the low carb that got way slower. So that shows individual differences. Some people do not perform well even at a mile without adequate carbs, whereas some people did okay, or maybe were a tiny bit faster, you know? So I think it's really fascinating too to look at those, it was two different people that had were extremely slower. Like you, their lines almost go all the way back up on the other side. And you don't see those extreme changes on the carb one. You know, no one was having these like visceral responses to to that, like they were low carb. So again, I think individual variations is an important piece of this too. So did you listen to the podcast? I did not. I had it pulled okay, up and I started to and I didn't have time to finish it. What did he say? I don't I didn't listen to it either, but I'm just oh. wondering, I mean, I'm assuming he's a low carb guy. And he's also a phenomenal athlete, but I think this goes back to almost our discussion about Emma Bates, where it's right. just, it's so individualized and maybe he's someone who doesn't need carbs as much as someone else. But what mm -hmm. is the, the point of this? Is it weight loss? Is it like, the what The study are you was for performance. It was people? performance and then to overall health. So there's kind of that notion out there, which we've talked about during the UCAN discussions of like, is it really good for us to be eating this many simple sugars? You know, that's not good for a human body. So they were tracking all sorts of different biomarkers with this test. So they were looking at what people's cholesterol did, what their blood sugar did. So kind of looking at some of those holistic wellness measures that you would get done at Inside Tracker or your yearly doctor visit also. Um, and fascinating enough, it stated that 30% of participants on the high carb diet averaged a blood sugar that was consistent with prediabetes. So they're trying to say that like high carb diets for performance are causing prediabetes. And I'm like, I, I just, my gut instinct was to get mad at that comment. I was like, there's no way that's true. So I scrolled through and looked at what they were measuring and what they were measuring translates to a hemoglobin A1C of 5.1, which is not pre-diabetic. And that's how we diagnose pre-diabetes. So that statement isn't even quite true. It's just a fearful tactic. Um, and then the other thing was it showed that the people on the low carb diet had an increase in cholesterol. So if somebody has a, you know, heart history, you know, issues in their family, maybe that's not a good idea. You know, let me ask you one other question in there. All right. So we're not talking about people that are doing a large amount of miles here for this test. Right. They're out. I don't, that's I don't a good know, point. I don't know if for the rest of the week they are doing the mileage. I don't I don't know, but so yeah. wouldn't that affect how you're processing carbs if you're not expending them through vigorous workouts? Then yeah, eating too many carbs would be bad. Like we know for a fact that if you're sedentary, eating carbs is bad for you. Excessive you have to have carbs. a balanced diet. Yeah, yeah. But the reason why we recommend high carbs is for endurance athletes is because you're actually using that energy to fuel your workouts. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing I don't know about the study. And, and again, uh, you know, I don't even know, you know, since I didn't listen to the podcast, I can't really comment on it. But is that the case of, of the athletes involved when they're measuring these things? How active were these people in the test? So they said they were highly trained male subjects, the 10 of them. But when you looked at it, they were averaging 30 miles per week running, which is pretty low for a marathon runner, right? Like that's not a significant amount of miles. And then the diets were either 50 grams of carbs for low carb or 350 for high carb. So depending on their body weight, you're right, Thomas, that could have been too much, but I don't, I could find it, but I didn't like calculate out how many grams per kilogram that was or anything like that. Was this a recent study? February 9th of this year. So yeah, more recent. Oh, wow. I, yeah. we're, I mean, I know... This isn't relevant, but like we're still just measuring dudes. Women are still not involved in studies. Well, they've Great already point. told you that women can absorb carbs. <laughs> That's right? true. Didn't women don't matter. That? Yeah. <laughs> Forget women. It's the men that we care about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were also calling these people middle-aged males in their 40. It was like, womp, womp. <laughs> yeah. Middle-aged. I mean, that is, that is the start of middle age, I think. I mean, if you're lucky and you live to 80, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You just tack on 20 extra years if it's really good. <laughs> and then you're like, why? The only reason I'm living to 100 is so I can run a marathon and get an article in Runner's World. To be no, like, at 100, right? you're not running a marathon. You're doing that 100-meter <coughs> walk sprint thing that those old guys do that is amazing. All right. It looks so, so I'll painful, make it, though. Well, you don't know. Maybe by that time, we'll, I'll be able to do the whole marathon. 
and then I'll be on the Guinness World Record book. Okay. Didn't a 94-year-old do it okay. or something? I think she no. just did the 5K. I'll just keep eating my carbs. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. She blazed it, though. It was like a 17-minute 5K. <laughs> fact checker. Where's our fact checker? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figured nobody would be able to check that quickly. <laughs> All right, so continuing on our carb discussion here, we have another question from Gina. She said, hey, all, I'm a longtime listener and have a question about carbs. Sometimes it feels like I'm eating the house down, trying to get in all the carbs I need for Ironman training. Does it matter if I'm eating pasta, bread, bagels, or grams? Lately, I found I'm, I really like high-quality juices like tart cherry, beetroot, and some of the Naked brand juices because I can sip on these all day and get a big carb boost to my diet. I do not buy the juice with added sugar, though. Is that a good tactic? I feel like I'm doing my body good, but maybe I'm just all in my head. Thank you. I think it's a fine tactic. It absolutely is. I think we've found that, you know, drinking fluids doesn't How's she racing would be the question. Yeah, you know. How does her workouts feel? How how does everything going? Sounds like it's going. Sounds like this is a choice that she's supporting and she wants us to say, yes, keep doing it, which I am. I think it's good. I think we can absolutely keep doing this. I mean, I've worked with a lot of Ironman athletes. You guys train. You guys make us look like sedentary. They train so many, like 12 Uh to 14 hours a week. So their carb needs are very high. Oftentimes their appetite is blunted, so they can't always listen to their appetite. So if we do need to drink some of those carbohydrates, we need to drink some of those carbohydrates. So I think it makes sense to play around with that. You know, from a performance standpoint, carbs are carbs. You know, so we know that things like juice actually restock glycogen stores faster than whole wheat pasta. So, you know, you're certainly not doing any harm by consuming some of those things. And if it helps your performance, like Thomas said, you know, I think it's worth playing around with and being open to different types of carbs that best support you, how you feel, your training, recovery, all that kind of stuff. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if she's eating pasta or bread or bagels or grams. It's kind of what she wants. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's get, getting enough in to fuel her runs. Yeah. Contrary to common belief, it doesn't have to be bagels. <laughs> I mean, I think it does. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're big on grams as well. Yeah. I mean, grams she's hitting all your, your, yeah. your bells, I guess. Yeah. When we were at Athletes Village, Meg and I whipped our grams out, and there was how many of us? Like eight sitting in a circle there, and like two other guys pulled theirs out too. I was like, yes. <laughs> Did you tell the... I took my grams. I had grams. Did you tell the story on the bus? Oh. The gram story to Megan? Did they tell you that? So Robbie's sitting next to this guy, and the guy uh, pulls out his gram crack, or was it Robbie pulled out gram crackers? One of the two pulled out gram No, it was the guy. The guy next to Robbie pulled out gram crackers. And he's like, oh, you're having gram crackers? He's like, yeah, I listen to this show, and they got, you know, they talk about the gram crackers, and... He said he listened to Allie Feller and she had a sports dietitian on and that she was recommending graham crackers. And Robbie goes, we know that dietitian <laughs> and we have a podcast with her. <laughs> Man, I was hoping you're going to like talk smack about me or something to him. Like, she's crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't put that cracker down. <laughs> I know. Those don't work. <laughs> I got this voicemail from Allie Feller on the weekend because I didn't have her number saved and I don't like, you know answer random numbers and it she said that they were doing like categories with cure tomato and it came up g and it was what you eat before you run and like she couldn't even get her mouth open and the whole crowd was like grams and i was like oh my god it's just been made look at this like making people fuel all over the running i feel like (laughs) there's an opportunity to have feather shaped graham crackers and a sponsorship how the sponsorship hasn't happened yet i don't uh, i don't get that one yeah i don't know where sport grams Sport grams with sodium and graham crackers. Hmm. I don't like that. Every box comes with a jug of water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't want the taste to change too much. But you're right. A little more sodium would certainly be beneficial pre rest Salted, burnt salted grams. <laughs> that sounds terrible. That's what I want. <laughs> no, no. Like, no, but a little sweet, a little salty. That They could make yeah. that work. Mm-hmm. Salted grams. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have another carb question. All the carb questions this week. So Carolyn said, hi, Fuel for the Soul. I had a question about the types of carbs we carb load with. Before Berlin 2022, I carb loaded pretty exclusively with bagels, pretzels, grams, bread, and pasta and felt absolutely incredible the entire race, which resulted in almost a 16-minute PR. Boom. Later that fall, I ran the New York City Marathon, the hot one, and felt like I didn't get as much out of my carb load as I did in Berlin. I live and work in New York City, so life was pretty 
business as usual leading up right up to the race. With the chaos of work, commuting, and trying to get every marathon weekend event, LOL. By late afternoon of days one and two of the carb load, I knew I was not on track to hit my goal and went down to the bodega to find whatever I could that had a high amount of carbs, Skittles and other candies, naked juices, etc. in an effort to get as close as I could That's to my goal. That's two naked juices. Obviously, the weather was miserable, and I'm sure that played a major role in how I felt that day, but I was wondering if there is any sort of hierarchy of the quality of the carbs we take in as part of the carb load. Are bagels, bread, pasta a, quote, higher quality carb that will give us better and longer energy than Skittles, or does our body process them all the same? Starting to think about this after the discussion of UCAN and Martin and how they are different types of carbs and processed differently by our body. So I was wondering if that could be applicable in real foods as well. Not that Skittles are real foods, LOL. Thank you guys so much for changing my relationship with food and nutrition, both on and off the race course. All right, first, I'm going to jump in before feathers. Generation UCAN and Martin aren't two different kinds of carbs. One is a carb ready to go. The other one has to be converted into sugar. In Wouldn't that body. make them two different things? Yeah. No. It, 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 I, maybe we should let the professional <clears throat> answer this because so far it wait, seems like you're batting zero. Uh, look, I stayed at a holiday <laughs> inn last night. I'm going to handle this one. Um, <laughs> it's the way that your body processes. The quality of the carbs is the same. It's just a different way to process the, to get to the carb. Megan, fact check this man. He's not He's not completely wrong. He's not completely wrong. So all carbohydrates learn are that. break. Learn, wait a second, Feathers. Megan, learn that phrase. He's not completely wrong. <laughs> I'm not siding with you completely, though. So all any type of carbohydrate we put into our body is going to be broken down into the same sugar molecule, right? So it's all broken down the same thing. So technically, yes, I guess you can would be broken down into something. But the way our body processes those types of things, I would not consider them the same. I, I agree with you, Meg. Like, I would not consider those two the same. I wouldn't consider lentil, pasta, and Skittles the same carb. Yes, they're going to be broken down, again, into sugar and used by our body, both of them, you know, but the way that they're going to get there, how much our body absorbs of them, how our blood sugar responds is all going to be very, very different between those two products. And that's why we eat red lentil pasta for lunch to keep us full all day because it's slowly absorbed. It doesn't spike our blood sugar. It has fiber and more vitamins and more minerals. Whereas if we eat the same number of carbs in Skittles, we're never going to feel full. It's going to spike our blood sugar. It's going to drop it back down. You know, that's what a healthy body is going to do. Anybody who doesn't have prediabetes, diabetes, diabetes, all of us that are running this much, you know, our body is very good at if we put more carbs in, our blood sugar, of course, is going to increase. But then we have insulin from our healthy pancreas that's going to bring that back down. But it's actually those increases in blood sugar that trigger insulin, which is a storage hormone for us, to store that carb as glycogen. So the whole up and down of your blood sugar during a carb load isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, that is actually what's stocking those glycogen stores. So if she found out she was behind and she could eat three times as many carbs in a bag of Skittles as she could with a bowl of red lentil pasta, you know, and her stomach wouldn't bother her because she didn't have all that fiber, you know, I think she did the right thing. I would encourage somebody to do something similar to that um, if they find themselves in that scenario where they're like, crap, I'm really behind. I need to get on top of this carb load. It works really well for me. You know, what do I do from here? All right. So this is confusing because <laughs> one, Skittles and lentils are the same shape, but two, uh, the rainbow. Earlier, yeah, earlier we talked about how carbs are carbs. So earlier you're saying all carbs are carbs and the carbs are good. Carbs. Great. You want to drink them. You want to eat them. However you want to get them in, get those carbs in. And now you're telling me it's different. You're right. I am. So I think in my mind, the context is important. So when we were talking about the person that a carb is a carb, just get them in. We're talking about adequacy of getting enough carbs in their daily diet for their performance, for their recovery. This is specific to a carb load. So this is specific to increasing that amount dramatically to get it stored into our body as extra energy. Um, so in that case, there might be better options for a carb load if we're behind to allow ourselves to eat more. But technically, if somebody's like listening to this and they're like, oh my, I can't eat Skittles anymore. I feel awful. I have people say that. Their blood sugar spikes and drops too quick and they feel- I don't they like feel, Skittles. 
<laughs> I think they're delicious. They feel that drop, so they don't feel good. So I've had a lot of people tell me I don't want to eat straight sugar when I'm carb loading because I don't feel good for three days. And I, that's a valid point, right? Like if you don't feel good eating more simple carbohydrates because of some of those swings in blood sugar and you're more sensitive to that, then we can carb load with more whole grains as long as your body handles the fiber. It just might take a little longer so that we just, if we get behind like this, we probably couldn't catch up as quick without having some of those more simple carbohydrates. So there's a million ways to carb load. It's just figuring out what works for you so that you're getting enough and you feel your best during those three days, um, which sometimes takes some planning. Okay, but so let's say it's the day before the marathon and I messed up and I am not, I did not do a good job of my carb loading. Are you saying that I should like double up for and make up for yesterday in one day? I would encourage you to increase it. I don't know if double up, that might be a little hard for some people. But I mean, when you look at the classic carb loading research, they're actually giving people 12 grams per kilogram of carbohydrate in two days. So it's usually a very high amount in a short amount of time. I stretched it out to three days because nobody was doing, it's too much food. Most people can't do it. So if you're taking that into consideration, I mean, they've even done one day carb loads in people. So it's physically possible. It's just hard for people to eat that much food sometimes. Also remember the whole point of the Morton gels was to be able to get as many carbs into Kipchoge as possible Mm -hmm. during his attempt at the sub two. So even then they're like he probably carved up plenty and they're probably like but let's jab some more and top that off and let's do it in a way that his stomach won't explode and so you bring up a good point so if you're somebody who doesn't carb load well or screws up your carb load you could technically take more fuel out there you just want to don't want to take so much more than your body's used to right like we have to train our gut to accept higher amounts of of gels but if in the past, you're like, I've never been able to carb load well. Maybe then you train yourself to take more gels in your next training cycle so you don't have to rely on it as much. It's just we've got two places we're getting fuel from during a race, and it's our stored glycogen and the gels that we take. So, you know, it's just kind of a balance of those two things. There's honestly no right or wrong way to do it. It's just what works best for each person so they're getting enough and have enough carbohydrates for that higher performance. I will say I feel like in general carbs – at least on, you know, like the main media channel that we watch, like Today Show and all those things. Like carbs are getting more love. Are They're getting a lot more love. Like they're being more accepted. They have dietitians on there that are explaining exactly how you do. Like this is an energy source. This is not a terrible thing. And so I feel like huh. we're seeing the shift back over to I'm wondering what the next thing will it's be. It's the though. carb mafia. Paying off the syndicate. Like, do you think fat's going to be the next thing that they're like, that's terrible if carbs you know, are OK? No, it's they'll be, be like, something. fat's great for you. Sprinkle some carbs on your fat. Or maybe it's meat. I feel like people hate meat yeah. right now. I, I do think fat's going to swing back around at some point as a villain again. Because it's, it's gone too extreme. Yeah. It was like no fat and then eat 90% fat. Like those are two massive extremes. I'm still not sure where we've, people have settled. So I could see that coming back around. Yeah. Yeah. I can see a low fat craze coming in real hot. Ugh. I'll tell you what, it came back as a craze this weekend. My chili. I made chili and everybody was crazy about it. (laughs) All right. Um, I think we talked enough about carbs today. Is there anything you want to wrap this up with, Megan? Any, Any wisdom to leave us with? I mean, one of the things that makes me very happy is that you guys are starting to question things that you see that don't align with what we've been talking about. And I love that you guys bring it here, right? Like Emma Bates didn't drink any water, you know, which we just decided is okay for her, but maybe not okay for us. And um, low carb. I mean, it's only doesn't okay with her because she had good results. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe those last results, two miles. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, we'd be like, well. Yeah. Could she have led the whole way? No, I'm kidding. I really don't think it was a hydration issue. Um, And also, when you're hearing things like low carb has equal performance as high carb, I know not everyone wants to read a study, so send it to us like you just did, and we can look it up and kind of look at it. But I love to hear this kind of stuff, especially like we said, this only came out two months ago, you know? So if there is research that changes how we practice as sports dietitians, like I'm open to it. But this research article was not that. <laughs> yeah. And then Ooh, really, truly. it's time to do a new research article. Put it, people that do 50 to 60 miles a week, have them do a week on low carb, take a week off, 
a week on high carb, I commission you feathers to do this study. <laughs> I need to find an institution to do it for me. I don't have an IRB at my house. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Yeah. No, but it would be interesting. I mean, I think we'd need that full month probably too. But I mean, I I don't know. Do you think we could get people to enroll in that study? Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I dig it. Easy day. I yeah. I yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. I think that probably wraps it up for this week. This episode may or may not be on YouTube um, <laughs> with the video. We had some internet connectivity issues so tbd on that one but our plan is to hopefully roll this out on youtube for you guys as well because we put the audio up over there and um people are eating it people are loving it so we're gonna we're gonna try and get the video up there eventually if not this one then hopefully next week's episode um yeah so if you have a question that we have not answered go ahead and send us an email at fuel for the soul podcast at gmail.com or you can leave us an audio message on the uh spotify podcaster app i have a question why aren't we using the good webcam? <laughs> Meg, okay. Now everyone can see your face when he talks. It's going to make it so much more clear for everybody. <laughs> I'm losing okay. my mind over here. Okay, can you do? Can you sign off, everyone? Bees and carrots. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> and graham crackers. <laughs> graham crackers. Oh, my goodness. To talk about gnarly nutrition. It's gnarly. <laughs> like Rufy. Oh. Wow. oh. <laughs> uh, That's wow. good. That's good. Let's see. There we go. Perfect. Ready for camera. Who's gonna go? Are you frozen, Megan? It's like a lag. Uh-oh. Oh. What? Is it ours or hers? It's the Megan Show. I hope this makes the bloopers. You should be on board. Should have a dance for you guys. No. Okay. All right. I'll show you my toast light in case anybody wants to see it. Oh, I guess you can't. Oh, there it goes. It's toast. If anybody wondered what's on my desk, there's a toast light. Plug it. Plug it back in. Can you check the one up in the office? Hosts need to come back, so I quit showing you what's on my desk. Are they taking a run break? Hello. Oh, I'm getting a text. Can you go up? Or Let's I'll see what it says. Is. Hang tight. Something happened to our internet. All right, so I'll just continue to put on a show for you. Let's see. I don't really have anything else exciting except for a wall full of supplements over here and pictures of my very cute children. Aren't they adorable? They're cute. I know. As Thomas said, they're very loud on my toast cracks in the morning. But that's what kids are supposed to be. Loud, funny, humor, interlude. Yeah. That's no nitric acid oxide. Or <laughs> <laughs> nitric ass side something. <laughs> oh, I almost uh, just fell out of my chair. <laughs>